After pulling this guy out of my storage and experimenting with it a couple of weeks ago, comparing it to my, my new cheap microphone, I figured I'd uh, revisit this guy and come uh, dig a little bit deeper into it, just, just for the fun of it. It's a neat piece of history. So this one, as I said, I picked it up at a, at a secondhand store um, who had got it from a church that bought it back in, well, when it was new, presumably back in the 40s or 50s or whenever that was. It sounds pretty weak, um, and I'm... I'm guessing some of that is just degradation due to age and some of it, the fact that it's got a really low output right now is probably due to the iron magnet in it losing its magnetic uh, properties over time as happens. So this is the Shure, let's see, can we even see this? This is the Shure model 55 with no apparent suffix. Uh, super cardioid unidyne unidirectional dynamic microphone made by Shure Brothers of Chicago, Illinois. Uh, over here, there is a, a tag identifying the impedance, and I'm having trouble reading it. But this particular model has an impedance adjustment switch here, which. Um, We'll take a look at the spec, the official specs in a minute, but that uh, allows us to change the impedance that this microphone presents out the connector to the amplifier or recording equipment or whatever from a low of, I think it's 50 ohms to a medium, which is in the 150 to 250 range to a high, which is in the, I want to say 10K range. But we'll, we'll look at that on the official you know, uh, information in a minute. So this one, um, the basic microphone doesn't have an on-off switch. The on-off switch is an added little module here, which has the Sher Brothers logo on it as well. I cleaned this one up a fair bit when I first got it. It's still not perfect, but it's got some vintage look to it. Let's go and take a look at some of the information that I found online about this guy. So as far as I can tell from the part number, model number that's on it, and the clues that I'm finding. This is probably the 1947 model, or the model that was introduced in 1947, because that's when they added the impedance switch. The nameplate just says 55. I can't see a 556, though it may be, because it does say on the tag, supercardioid. And the next major change that they made was 1951, where they changed the size of it to the small size and they added an XL connector, which this one doesn't have. So that pretty much dates it to somewhere between 1947 and 1951 or possibly a little bit later, but that would be the manufacturer dates anyway. I have no way of knowing when the church that originally bought this thing picked it up, but I'm going to guess it's somewhere in that range. So this is the data sheet for the 1951 model, the S, the slightly smaller one. Um, there are there were other versions, uh, SWO with switch, uh, the gold version, which had a gold-plated finish, which would look pretty gaudy, and I don't know that I've seen any pictures of them, although I'm sure they're out there somewhere. As they're saying, they're ideal for high-quality public address, theater sound systems, remote broadcasting applications, and other sound applications such as hotels, stadiums, and public auditoriums. Though I note in the in this official Sure document that has uh, the history of it, they're talking pre nineteen forty seven. They're talking about voice clarity and paging and two way radio systems. They're not even talking about broadcast or well, maybe it's public address uh, or live stage or any of that kind of stuff. So some of the reasons for the different impedances. So one hundred and fifty to two hundred and fifty ohms is what a typical micro dynamic microphone these days comes in around. Um, it's kind of become the standard. The low impedance is generally intended for long cable lengths, so you don't get as much induced hum into the into the cable. And the high impedance versions 
were for use directly into a tube-based amplifier, which typically do have a high impedance input, just that's the nature of the beast. However, a lot of amplifiers and whatnot also have a transformer as the first input stage for matching. So tube amplifiers that were designed with a, for a medium impedance, 150 to 250 ohms, would generally have a matching transformer in the, as the front stage. Also, a lot of earlier um, condenser microphone preamplifiers, to get the phantom power on, they would use a center tap on that transformer. That way they could send the power out to the microphone through the center tap and get it evenly, uh, the same positive voltage on both pins 2 and 3, uh, and then ground would be on pin 1, and that would isolate the phantom voltage from the grid voltage, the grid bias voltage on the first tube input stage. Of course, nowadays, since no, almost nobody's using tube preamplifiers, that's not really done. So here we've got the general specs, some replacement parts and whatnot. And again, this is the uh, switched model, the W, uh, which I don't have on mine, but it shows some, uh, some ways to get into it to do some repairs and maintenance and down here we have the typical frequency response chart and the cardioid pattern so this is looking from above see most of the sound will come in from the front there's a little uh, blip at the back but that is 10 db lower than the peak at the front it's fairly wide compared to some microphones and here's the frequency response uh, on a logarithmic graph. Do you notice it's relatively flat from, what is that, probably about 125 or so up to 1100 hertz. And then it uh, bounces up about 4 dB higher than that until so 1600 and then it craters right down to 10,000. Compare that to its modern cousin, the ubiquitous Assure SM58, and its low-end response is actually very similar. It stays flat, pretty much the same, but uh, the drop-off happens, the high-frequency drop-off happens a lot higher. Still got that little bobble in there, though. So, if mine was in good condition, it would it wouldn't sound... Yeah, it wouldn't have the high ends as much as a 58 would, but it would sound reasonably close. So, and again, this is looking at a slightly more modern version, um, the 1950s version. But there is the, how the impedance switching is done. Let me just grab that zoomer tool here again. So basically it's done with a transformer. There is the actual microphone cartridge. No, there's the microphone cartridge over there. There's the matching transformer and then the little switch just selects what's going on. When I first got this one, um, like I said I bought it used. It didn't come with a cable or connector or anything. And I didn't have available to me the correct Amphenol connector. I had I did have a four pin one, um, so this is the shell off that. And then I just butchered up an XLR connector to poke into the holes. I'll just pull this guy out, pin one of the ground, and pins two and three. So that's, that's the original connector that it should have for this age, from the 1940s, early 50s. Um, and again, this little module here is just a switch, so I should be able to, oh, I know I can. I haven't been inside this thing for probably 20 some years since I bought it, but so there's, ooh, so can I crust the original wiring in there? Yeah, that hasn't been moved in a long time. Gonna have to be careful. But there is the optional add-on switch. It's just a rotary on-off switch. I want to be a little bit careful that I don't mess up that screw, but it's not in there very tight anyway. 
I think I just probably tightened it with a coin. It looks like it's designed for that exact purpose. So there is how this guy actually originally came uh, or would have come without the optional switch. So there's four screws to get inside the head. And I'm going to be careful because I don't want to damage anything. And I'm not, ooh, no, I'm going to get a better screwdriver than that. There, that's a better fit. As I said, I'm, I don't care about the resale value on this thing because I'm never going to sell it. But I don't want to mess up something that's this cool and old. So there's four screws hold the grill on. drop them out and it's not being I think it's just being held in there by friction and age okay there we go. So there's the grill off. And the cloth is in pretty good shape. There's a little bit of gouge and staining and stuff in here. But I think a lot of that is actually just the glue that holds it in. It's a little tiny tear in the cloth down there. That's been there for a long time. I'm going to leave that mostly alone. I might, I might just dust it out a little bit. But that's about it. So here is the internals. This foam back here is just shock mounting foam and that, that is something that I replaced about 20 years ago. Um, what was originally in there was a similar density but it was uh, really beat up and just dry and crumbly, kind of like those, that rubber there. That rubber just sort of holds this whole assembly back off the face a little bit in case it gets whacked. So there is the impedance matching transformer, um, which we saw a little bit about on the, uh, on the website there, on that manual. There's the two wires coming out of the voice coil. So this whole assembly, oh, hello. I'm going to look at that tag in a second. So that whole assembly is held in by these two screws on the back. Gently bring them out. Uh oh, what was that covering? I'm gonna have to look back at the video and just see. But anyway, there we have the whole mic capsule assembly. That's just the bracket that holds it. The whole thing is sprung for shock mounting. I'm not going to go in any further because it's got this grill cloth glued on there. But down in there, we can see the, tra the pin matching transformer and the switch. And up in there, I'll try and get a good view of that. The original patent tag, 1946. So there's not much that I can do to this old fella to improve the sound of it. Other than selecting the selecting the correct impedance for the preamplifier that I'm using, I'll just gently put this guy back together. All right, now that I've got it reassembled, let's see if it still works. Hello, one, two, three. Yes, it seems like it does. So this is set to the medium impedance setting. Well, thanks for watching. I, I appreciate you coming along for this little ride. I hope you found this interesting. I certainly did. I always like messing around with his old stuff. Anyway, um, if you got anything to, to ask or say about this, um, please leave it down in the comments as usual. I'll talk to you later.